Hi, this is Thomas White. I'm the founder and executive director of the Intercollegiate Business Ethics Case Competition. The point of this presentation is to help both teams and judges alike prepare for the competition. At this point, you already should have familiarized yourself with the presentation guidelines and with the judging form. If you have not been involved in the competition before, you should watch one of the videos of one of the earlier presentations that we have up on the website. The point of this presentation is to offer a kind of reminder and elaboration of the perspective that we take when it comes to ethics in the presentations. As you should already know, we take a secular philosophical approach to ethics. The reason for this is very practical. In an international multicultural world, it's important to find some kind of general or more or less universal standard on which everyone can agree. That means that instead of legal, cultural, religious, or deeply personal approaches to ethics, we want something that's more secular and is based on some kind of common standard. This is what philosophers try to do when we talk about ethics. But at the same time, in the competition, we want people to talk about ethics in a simple, practical, common sense way that reflects the way people talk about ethics in business. This presentation then aims to give you more of a background in our perspective in the hope that it will keep everyone pretty much on target in the presentations. Okay. So what we're gonna do, I'm going to give you a quick introduction to what the way that philosophers talk about ethics, at least in the in the broadest way, and then talk about the connection between that and business as a way that everyone will at least recognize what ballpark we're operating in uh, during the competition. Okay, ethics is really something that everyone is is quite familiar with. Uh, we're using it from our standpoint point of view just talking about the difference between right and wrong, we're really just looking at ways that people positively and negatively evaluate actions. Obviously it has a long history. It goes back from a philosophical standpoint all the way to ancient Greece. And from the for the purposes of this presentation, the um, and I think it's also useful in the, in the competition, uh, we aren't going to be distinguishing between ethics and morals, ethical and moral. Uh, really, etymologically, the only difference between ethics and morals is that ethics comes from the Greek, morals comes from the, from the Latin. Some people will stipulate, stipulate differences between these, but uh, the idea is to keep things fairly uh, plain and simple at this point. Now, on the one hand, obviously, there's a great deal of disagreement about, about right notions of right and wrong. We, the surfaces, of course, and differences in laws, cultures, religion, and individual differences. The good news, though, is that on the other hand, there really is a good deal of agreement among philosophers, at least in the most very general, very basic ways that we can talk about things. And I think that uh, one fairly practical way of looking at this is to say that there are at least two fundamental principles that there seems to be pretty good agreement on. One, do no harm and to treat others appropriately. Now, obviously, there are lots of ways that that can be interpreted, uh, which is part of what we're going to be looking at. But the point is to start, you know, that we're going to start with this idea that there are, that when we talk about ethics, there are two sort of secular, practical principles that can be used to evaluate actions and to identify ethical dilemmas, do no harm, treat others appropriately. Okay, why those principles? Why do no harm? Why treat others appropriately? Why do I say that those can you know, be recognized by most philosophers as, as pretty general, pretty universal principles? Now, this is the fundamental assumption that you have to uh, live with for a while. But the presupposition on which this whole presentation and the general approach that philosophers take to ethics is the following that these two principles, do no harm, treat others appropriately, are more or less universal standards that are grounded in the idea that there are very basic human needs that we all have that have to be met in order to live even a rudimentarily satisfying life. Now you typically hear about this idea when people refer to basic human rights. What I am going to suggest is that whenever anyone says that you know, we have a basic human right to something, they're saying that we absolutely positively need it because of the way that we're constituted in order to have a satisfying life. But this is the assumption on which this whole approach is built. It's one that you may need to just kind of live with for a while, but the, the notion of basic human rights, I'm sorry, basic human needs, 
leading into the idea that this is why we have these two principles and then principles that serve as a as a criteria for separating right from wrong is where we're gonna where we're gonna start. The parallel to this idea that there are basic needs that humans have by virtue of the way that we are constituted. Uh, the parallel is with the idea that there are very specific material conditions necessary for physical health. Now there may be some individual variation among these things, but there's not a lot. We all need oxygen, we all need food of a certain sort, we all need uh, air of a certain sort, we all need certain healthy conditions, we all need uh, exercise or moving the body in some way. The nature of the body, the physical nature of the body, determines what conditions have to be met in order for it to be in a condition that is healthy. Uh, health is not a matter of personal opinion. We may, even if we say, I mean, we, there are certainly situations where people will say, well, I feel healthy, when in reality they aren't. So the idea here is that we're looking at this idea that there are material conditions of physical health determined by the body. This general approach to ethics says, okay, extend that idea. There are a variety of needs that have to be met. You know, the human person is, is, is more than the body. There are a variety of needs that have to be met in order for us to say, not that we're healthy, but that, that life is at least in the most basic way satisfying. And so the idea here is to recognize the claim that there are fundamental conditions that humans need in order to have an acceptable life, that this gets talked about in different ways. The, uh, sometimes this is talked about as basic satisfaction, growth, particularly when, when people talk about this as it relates to non-humans, the notion of flourishing. Uh, some philosophers will talk about this as happiness, although that has a, you know, to the modern ear, that has an unfortunate uh, emotional ring to it. But uh, the point is that the nature of the being is such that it sets its, its what it needs. Now, the lack of a basic need, of one of these basic needs, produces not just a sense of mild inconvenience, but a very deep level of dissatisfaction. And that's one of the most important ways that you'd, you'd want to think about whether you're in a domain, in a problem, where you have this kind of thing going on. If you don't have this need met, what's the consequence going to be? Is it just going to be you know, crankiness, or is it going to be such a fundamental level of dissatisfaction that's a, that it really kind of eats away at, at one's soul. Now, as I said before, this is more, this approach more likely surfaces when people talk about the notion of rights. And so what I'm arguing is that the fundamental rationale for why we can even claim rights to something in the most basic way is to be able to say, well, we need it when we need it because of the way that we are constituted. There are various statements about rights, human rights. The UN's Declaration of Human Rights is one. There are many others, but they, they when you look at them carefully, they tend to share a good deal of commonality. And that then, gives us a more of a detailed list of what we see in uh, as far as what these rights would be. Obviously, first a need to life, secondly a need for physical health and safety, emotional health and safety, and the absence of pain and suffering. A need for freedom, whether it be action or beliefs or access to freedom of some kind of spiritual life. Uh, a need for education, now it's important to realize here that to say that we have a need for education doesn't necessarily mean that we, we need formal education, but it does mean that, that if we're living in a society, if we're living with other people, if we're living in a community, we have a need for acquiring the necessary skills to live successfully in that community. And that if we're systematically deprived of those, of those uh, skills, there's no way that we can live uh, anything more than a really grim and desperate life. Another set of needs for fairness, to be cared for when we need that, equality, respect for our dignity as persons, things like privacy, to have promises kept and honesty. Now notice this is a different kind of need than what we've been seeing before, which were more, t more tangible. Uh, access to meaningful emotional relationships, 
Humans are marvelously social beings, so the need for family, friends, some kind of intimate partnership, at least having the option for all of those, and the need for rest. So this is at least a basic list that would be fairly common among about any statement of human, of basic human rights that you'd find. And it gives us the most uh, sort of fundamental standard that we can go with in saying, okay, what, uh, what would a, uh, a secular, practical, universal foundation of ethics look like? As I said before, the, if you want to test whether or not something is a real need or not, ask what life would be like without it. And in this, kind, in this situation, life without any of these things really is pretty grim. Uh, life without a uh, sense of physical health and safety or emotional health and safety, life without freedom. You can go down the list and uh, to be systematically prevented from having access to any of these things, to have any of these needs met, uh, really is a, produces a level of, such a fundamental level of dissatisfaction uh, that it leads people to do, uh, sometimes to ask fairly, act fairly desperately. Um, think of the, the many times over human history where the deprivation of freedom has led people to put their lives on the line, uh, risk life, indeed die, uh, in order to ensure that, for the, if, if not themselves, at least for, uh, for the people close to them. Uh, absolutely dramatic testimony to the power of this kind of need and the level of dissatisfaction that the absence of, of one of these needs uh, produces. By contrast, think of what life is like without having wants satisfied, whether it be, you know, a new car, luxuries, or whatever. Um, yeah, it can be uh, it can be unhappy. It can be disturbing, uh, not to get what you want, to get not to get into not to get the job you want, not to get into the school you want. Uh, but uh, that's a different level of dissatisfaction than not being able to have a job at all, for example, or to have a luxury item. So here's the connection now between the notion of basic human needs and, and ethics. Obviously what I'm suggesting here is that this list of basic human needs becomes the foundation for an ultimate standard in ethics. And remember, we're, we're still working under this idea that we have do no harm and treat others appropriately as fundamental ethical principles. So the ethical character of an action, I'm arguing, that is whether it's right or wrong, describes whether that action fosters or prevents the satisfaction of these needs. So in this way, to say that something is right or wrong, or whatever language you like to use, ethically acceptable, um, ethically indefensible, that's a shorthand way of saying that uh, that action either promotes a satisfaction or prevents a satisfaction of the needs that are involved. Um, Obviously, when you look at a, at a practical ethical dilemma, there, are going to be, there can be conflict between the needs of people, but, uh, but for now, what we're doing is simply looking at the idea that this list of needs gives us the basis of a secular, universal approach to uh, making judgments about whether or not an action uh, promotes or gets in the way of the satisfaction of need, these needs of the people involved. Which then takes us back to where we started, this idea that I'm claiming that do no harm, treat others appropriately, can serve as, as basic ethical issues. Now notice that, uh, and we're going to go back to the list in a minute, that to, tie, to say do no harm really means that we're going to be identifying very specific tangible ways in which people's interests are affected. And treat others appropriately is more intangible. And I should say, by the way, treat when I say appropriately, it's appropriate to the need that people have. It is not appropriate in a way that people um, judge personally. It is not appropriateness from the standpoint of a culture. It is appropriate in terms of this list of basic human needs we've already been looking at. So we go back to the list of needs. These items that come up in red are tangible, and these would then relate to the principle of do no harm. Life, physical safety, absence of pain and suffering, emotional safety, education, need for care, relationships, rest, tangible material stuff of life, and that if those get compromised, it's fair to say in some way there's some kind of tangible harm. 
What comes up in green is related to this issue of what counts as appropriate treatment. That is, we have a need for having our freedom of choice respected, whether or not there's any tangible uh, benefit from it or not. We have a need for fairness, to be treated equality, uh, with respect for the dignity of our persons and, and, and the like. And uh, it's important to keep in mind this is a separate need from, uh, from the material. That is, there is something about the way humans are constituted that we simply need to be treated in a certain way. And if we aren't, even if we aren't deprived materially, uh, the, uh, the need is not met. A uh, great example here is the fact that before the Civil Rights Act in the United States, uh, it was uh, the doctrine separate but equal was in many states, or in some states in the, in the United States, an acceptable uh, legal standard for treating, uh, for racial treatment. Uh, the idea was, well, if whites and non-whites alike get equal uh, public accommodations, equal transportation, equal parks and recreation and the like, then there was no harm. And the fact that as long as whites and non-whites had the same material conditions, there was no problem. Uh, now, the problem obviously came up when the fact that both whites and non-whites may get to ride on the same bus and get the same transportation, but being told you have to sit in the back of the bus ultimately was recognized as such a fundamental affront to the dignity of the human person that it was recognized as being unethical and an unacceptable policy. But that had nothing to do with the material conditions as much as the uh, just the way that we're entitled to be treated. So it's this combination of tangible and intangible needs. Now slight elaboration on both of these things. Obviously if we say the principle do no harm it means do no direct harm, but it also means avoiding foreseeable harm, which suggests a responsibility for determining the consequences of our actions, that is the risk of harm, and that there's a responsibility for that as well. It also means that whether intentionally or unintentionally we, we do some damage, there's an obligation to repair that. So what we're going to see is with both principles, obviously there's more that we can look into. Similarly, treat others appropriately refers to issues of fairness, respect, promise keeping, freedom of choice and the like, but there are a variety of other issues that, will, that come up as you explore matters of privacy, dignity, uh, and how this all works out then in terms of the clash between the rights or the needs of one and the, and the needs of another. But the, uh, the point here is to recognize that do no harm, treat others appropriately. Fairly basic, do let us you know, move as a point of departure, but it uh, still keeps us within those two uh, distinct domains. Now, you uh, may have had a philosophy course, or you may be in a philosophy course, in which you hear a more technical way of talking about this. Uh, the, uh, what philosophers refer to as a teleological approach is obviously, uh, what, those of you who are familiar with it, what's going on with the, this approach of do no harm, which focuses on the results. The, uh, a de what's called a deontological approach relates to this idea of treating others appropriately. And the, uh, in that case, it's, this, it's the, the two major philosophical traditions that focus on the one hand on what we do and how it affects others. Um, the, uh, now, the, the approach that we're taking in, in this, which is what I'm suggesting, sort of reflects the, the teleological and deontological strains in philosophical ethics, refers to external um, ideas, or the ex external factors, we might say, of the, you know, in, in the actions, which differs from what's called virtue ethics, which has become pretty popular among philosophers in the last uh, 20 years, and as, as we'll see, surfaces in lots of uh, corporate ethics statements, mission statements, uh, statements of company values where the focus, the language is more on how, on how we do things. And so it actually has more of a kind of internal psychological component. So reference to virtues and values such as integrity, respect, honesty, compassion, humility, uh, trust, and the like. Uh, now, these are all, are all a perfectly appropriate way to talk about uh, ethics. Um, th in this presentation, I'm de-emphasizing that uh, because the internal 
psychological is a little harder to uh, to nail down than if we talk about uh, do no harm and and the uh, apparent public ways of treating others appropriately. However, all of these three approaches are complementary and each reveals something different in diagnosing an ethical problem or coming up with an ethical ethical solution. Uh, now, I do want to uh, add before we move on that uh, while uh, these approaches, um, you know, do no harm, treat others appropriately, uh, lists of values reflect a uh, deontological approach, a teleological approach, and virtue ethics. Uh, in the competition, we really don't want to hear the language, we don't want to hear that kind of language. Remember, we want ethics talked about in a way that is consistent with the way people talk about ethics in businesses and the way that is a simple practical way. So um, do not do not talk do not say deontological, do not say teleological, do not say you know John Stuart Mill, Immanuel Kant, categorical imperative, um, Aristotle or the golden mean or the like. So um, while I wanted to say a little bit about the philosophical traditions these come from, uh, don't think that this is now something where uh, this has to be the language of the presentation. In fact, the surest way not to make it into the championship round is to is to let technical philosophical language uh, um, be the way that you that you talk about ethics. One final point. When we talk about do no harm, treat others appropriately, when we talk about the fact that we're looking at actions and consequences, keep in mind that both must be ethically acceptable. This is not pick and choose ethics, where one, as long as one principle is, works, then, then that's all you need to do. Uh, and finally, uh, ethics is more than just don't lie, cheat, or steal. Uh, the economic meltdown of 2008, for example, great example here. It was probably legal, it certainly wasn't ethical, and in many of the interviews that I uh, saw with people defending the actions uh, of uh, some of the questionable actions that were going on, the, answer, the defense was, well, we didn't lie, cheat, or steal. In fact, it almost got to the point where it sounded like one word. Well, we didn't lie, cheat, or steal. Well, ethics is more than lying, cheating, and stealing. And uh, make sure that you recognize that in the competition, this is about the sensitivity to recognize the various uh, more subtle ways in which ethics comes up than the heavy-handed don't lie, cheat, or steal. It's more than that. Uh, you can hurt people, you can treat people inappropriately without lying, cheating, or stealing. So having talked about the general idea of ethics, what ethics is, the way that in the most basic way uh, philosophers approach it, let's move on to the connection between this and business because after all the whole point of the competition is to look at the connection between ethics and business and as I've been as I've been saying the idea is to talk about that to talk about ethics in a way that's consistent both with a fairly common sense and practical way but also in a way that surfaces with uh, the way people talk about ethics and business. I'm going to do this in a couple of ways. First of all as I mentioned before while I didn't put much emphasis on virtue ethics, in reality the idea of identifying virtues and values that companies have an allegiance to is very popular and is really the best way to talk about, I think one of the best ways of talking about ethics in business because after all the company already has said this is who we are, these are the values that we that we embrace and but also what I want uh, large part of this presentation is to see that that's not just an arbitrary decision, that this comes out of a recognition of the basic needs that that people have that give us the foundation for ethics. So first I'm going to point out some ways in which these basic needs uh, surface in statements of companies' mission and values, and then also look at uh, some policy statements from a particular company. And the idea is to see that uh, there, uh, more than at the beginning, uh, companies are identifying ethical issues without even intending to talk about them as ethical issues. But let's start this way. This is a uh, the, from the mission and, and value statement of Bristol Myers Squibb, the well-known pharmaceutical company. Obviously, things uh, identified in red are going to be related to tangible issues and green uh, intangible. So the mission statement, to discover, develop, and deliver innovative medicines that help patients prevail over serious diseases, clearly related to the material need for health. 
our commitment to our patients and customers, employees, global communities, shareholders, environment, and other stakeholders. We promise to act on our belief that the priceless ingredient of every product is the integrity of its maker, an intangible need. We operate with effective governance and high standards of ethical behavior. We seek transparency and dialogue reference to how we all want to be treated, with our stakeholders to improve our understanding of their needs. We take our commitment to economic, social, and environmental sustainability, all material needs, seriously and extend this expectation to our partners and suppliers. When you go down this list, commitment to patients, employees, global communities, shareholders, environment, you'll notice again reference to disease, economic benefit, jobs after all make it possible for people to put uh, food on the table and have a roof over their head. To the employees recognition of the importance of, of diversity, respect for individuals, professional development and the like as well as personal health and safety. Health again under global communities. To the shareholders material need for financial security, environment, while they say we encourage the preservation of natural resources and st strive to minimize the environmental impact of our operations and products, environmental issues are, off, are too often are sort of characterized as something like tree hugging when it typically comes down to issues also of um, the health and safety of anyone, as I, as I hinted before, anyone living downstream. Now here's a different set of values. This is by the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. Different format and in this case a very clear statement of what the values are that are being um, identified. Integrity, diversity. Now the elaboration you'll see integrity and diversity re reflecting intangible needs. The subsequent values stewardship, leadership, open communication, teamwork, stewardship, in this case, since it's a water, the water district, uh, very definitely relating to the health and safety of people using the resource, leadership, open communication, and teamwork as the values. These are all elaborations of how this organization says they treat one another and that they treat one another, and I would say appropriately. The goal is to treat others appropriately. That is consistent with what it is that 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 we need in order to have a sense that life is fundamentally okay. This is now a different way of talking about this. This is a company, this is Megat PLC, the British company, and while you'll see on this list their policies, ethics and business conduct is there as the second item, what I want to do is to show you some other items out of their policy statement where they're addressing what they would say are issues of aspects of the business. But what I'm suggesting is that in doing that they're identifying ways in which fundamental ne human needs are, are surfacing and how they're going to how they're going to treat them. First, their group data protection policy. Okay, this is a company that ends up with a fair amount of, of personal information. They're recognizing that privacy is a fundamental matter. Fairness. Now notice that the bottom the bottom two bullet points when they say how they're going to operate, it isn't just a matter of uh, rather, it is not just a matter of are they following the laws, but what constitutes a fair way of treating people whose information they have. They say whenever possible individuals are advised of the personal data which has been obtained or retained, its source and the purposes for which the personal data may be used or disclosed, and in most cases that the individual has consented to the use of their information. So going beyond the law, but working with this idea that this is just what people would regard as fair. A corporate responsibility policy, you'll notice explicit reference to human rights, equal opportunities, allowance for individuality of people with different needs, and fairness again. Continuing their corporate responsibility policy, reference to the need to have safe working conditions, clear and open system of internal communication, grievance procedure, confidential ethics line, recognition of what it is, means to respect a principle of justice, a need for justice and fairness. Their environmental policy, very clearly here, respect for material needs, pollution, reducing the emission of harmful substances which compromise people's health and safety. 
Speaking of health and safety, can't get any more explicit than that. But notice here that they say the Board of Directors of Megat PLC recognizes the important responsibility which it has towards ensuring the health, safety, and welfare of its employees and any other persons who may be affected by its activities. Now, it may be legal and it, and it may be profitable to have stopped that sentence at health and safety and welfare of its employees. But recognizing that, as I mentioned before, part of, a rec part of, of, of understanding what do no harm means means accepting responsibility for the consequences of, of your actions, they're recognizing that people, any number of people could be affected by the activities. Any number of people are literally or figuratively downstream and that it is a, in a respect, what I'd say is a recognition of a respect of do no harm, a respect for the need of, of humans for, for health and safety. That they're saying their policy is that uh, this has to, those the health of those people has to be insured as well. So what we see here is that uh, with the with Bristol-Myers Squibb, with the Water District of Southern California, we look at a quick look at their mission and value statements where you get one way of seeing their allegiance to these fundamental human needs surfacing in their fundamental statements. Here with the uh, MEGAT policy statements, it isn't even their ethics and business conduct policy. But again, a recognition of the fact that this is that these needs are in business, and this is where it's surfacing. So to recap, what I've been trying to do is, as I said right at the beginning, to make sure that judges and teams alike are pretty much on the same page. That if uh, nothing else, there's this recognition of the idea that we're the the ballpark we're in is one where the presupposition is that there are. Uh, there's a certain commonality among hu all human beings that there we can identify those as, as very basic human needs that have to be met for us to have a even a rudimentary sense of satisfaction in life. That in the most uh, sketchy way, most basic way, most simple way we can say that those ideas can be reflected in the principle of do no harm, treat others appropriately, and corollaries of those principles and that when we look at the connection between that and business, what we see are different ways and for the, for the purpose of, of this presentation, looking at uh, statements of values, statements of policy, a convenient way of seeing the ways in which these ideas get uh, very explicitly directed, uh, at attended to by these companies. And that this then I, I would say is in the competition where a good deal of the focus should be, that is, does a company have a statement of values? What are they? How does that relate to what's the uh, what's at the issue at hand? Uh, and the um, uh, the point then is going to be to show the connection between these basic human needs, uh, but more importantly, just the way in which the company has the allegiance to this and recognize uh, not only what those values are, but where the tension is between the different ones and how that all gets gets worked out. And so I'd like to wish everyone good luck and uh, hope this has been helpful.